ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of A Chat with Matt. Today is the final of the CCMA coverage. So shout out to the CCMAs for uh, allowing me to take part and interview some of the nominees. And, oh, we got a howler for the last one. We got an absolute howler. We got alternative album nominee for Who I Am, Corey Marks. Corey, how are you doing, bro? Hey, Matt. I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. No, uh, th- thanks for taking the time, man. Like, you've had a crazy, crazy... A couple of years, I imagine, with uh, who I am and the release of a bunch of bangers with some absolutely killer artists on the on the record. Uh, I kind of want to start with obviously I got to ask about uh, Outlaws and Outsiders because that that collaboration on paper is possibly one of the most adventurous um, collaborations list I've seen on one song. So how how did you get? Uh, someone from old school metal, new school metal, and old school country, and yourself on the same track. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I grew up on on country music, classic country music, and I grew up on on rock. And then into my teens, I got into metal, and uh, and I think that's what country music's mi- missing is just a little bit of diversity. I find there's a lot of um, you know, it's really more country pop these days, and um, I, I figured I, I try to give it a new lane, and uh, you know with what i grew up on is like i said country and rock so and even hard rock so i thought you know especially with a producer like kevin Churko, why not blend those uh, genres together and uh, i'm just lucky enough that these artists featured travis tritt of course uh ivan moody and mcmars um you know i'm just i'm just so thankful they they uh, love the song and the message and wanted to be part of it yeah no it's a fantastic song with a great <clears throat> message and seeing all these artists collab with a Canadian country artist like yourself is just amazing to see you break into that international state because that's another issue I see with a lot of country artists as well it's the I don't want to say lack of ambition but almost like fear of trying something different in order to see Mm -hmm. how it goes and and you took that and yeah you understood the assignment essentially with yeah. that collab like it was it's, it's amazing to see what with, with the the country genre as it is you mentioned kind of like it's been more the pop and country side of things where, where do you see country kind of going in the next few years especially following this post-pandemic period honestly i have no idea <clears throat> it's uh it's it's kind of been staggered for the last few years and uh again i hope to change that and give uh, country music a new lane for i know there's a lot of you know, country rockers out there that that love those genres of music just like me. And I, I know there's a lot of great artists out there as well that, um, you know, there's there's other artists like Brantley Gilbert, who was definitely a little more rock at his start. Jason Aldean, and of course, uh, my my favorite, uh, Eric Church, um, always a little bit edgier, especially in the live shows. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a bit of an open book right now. I just hope that there's room for uh, for guys like me. Well, I definitely believe there is, and I'm excited to see um, where your journey goes. But you're you're still kind of fairly new in your journey. How how long have you been involved with the genre itself now? Uh, I've been my first release uh, to Canadian country radio was in 2014, a song called "Smartphone." Uh, but I've been writing, uh, you know, back and forth in that in, uh, in Nashville uh, since 2000. And- 12 2011 2012 so i've been i've been at this uh singer songwriting thing for 10 years now and uh seems like i'm finally getting a break so it's it's uh it's quite nice and and what drew you to the genre of country specifically because was was there anything growing up that made you want to go more towards that like a family influence or is there just something in country music that drew you in Oh, totally. Um, my, uh, my family is a, you know, I grew up in a, in a musical family. So, uh, you know, mom and dad would play guitar and sing those old Merle Haggard songs and George Jones. And we had a, you know, a family gathering every Thanksgiving because myself and my prepare were, were born on the same day. We're the evil twins. Uh, so my mom's the baby of eight and I'm the baby out of the whole family essentially. And I just happened to be born on the same day as my prepare, my grandfather. So it was always very special. I always go back, back in time. Uh, you know, when I pick up an acoustic and play a little bit of Merle or, or, or whatever, you know, so I think it was just growing up on that genre. Um, you know, mom, uh, every Sunday, I, you know, I remember her do, doing her house chores and doing her hair to the CMT, you know, watching, watching those uh, music videos and, and stuff. So I, I think it was just, I was just born into it. It's kind of in my blood, if, if you will. Um, but, you know, my dad was also, 
Uh, he was in a country uh, western band with his uh, his brother, my uncle uh, Wolf Milestone. Um, so I grew grew up on a lot of that, and you know, my dad being a drummer got me into drums at an early age, and that transitioned into you know wanting to listen to to more bands like Rush and Deep Purple, Grand Funk, and then got into more progressive stuff like Pantera, Arch Enemy, and Ozzy Osbourne, and and that's where that my love really for for rock and metal kind of came into as as later on in my teens, around fourteen, fifteen, and um then once i became once i once i started singing and, and songwriting it was kind of like a natural flow to go into more of a country you know style with you know i write these songs acoustically but then you get a producer like kevin who could definitely beef things up uh beef things up is the perfect word i'd use because <laughs> it's just i i was listening through a good chunk of the material before we got on this call and and it it makes me so happy as someone who started in the music industry in the rock genre is seeing what you're doing with the genre and evolving it is the right word I'd like to use because evolution in music is so important, especially in a world where commercialization and focusing on specific dollar points or just focusing on anything that's not the music. I, I can tell just from listening to the material that, uh, you've put out it's it's very apparent that you're aware of your own being as a writer and an artist well thanks man i'm, I'm glad you uh you're digging the sound and, and these songs um i think i think it's kind of our job as artists to be unique in in our own ways and tell our own stories and and kind of do our own thing you know and uh, you mentioned it before of you know um essentially artists just being confined to this box you know and it's got to look sound and be a certain way and you know i don't really agree with that i think that's what made all these artists that we grew up on whether they're rock country or metal i think that's what really made them different and that's what made them who they were is that they were outside the box they're always a little bit different than everything else going on and um you know that's what i hopefully um you know, end up, end up being, and that's what I, that's what I want to be is, uh, you know, something different, uh, basically a new flavor for, for country and rock. Why, why do you feel like the, the industry, especially in the past, like five to 10 years has kind of conformed more to that structure kind of box as opposed <laughs> to allowing artists to be a bit more flexible and free with their creative control? Well, I think things have changed definitely uh, compared to, you know, where they were in the 80s and 90s, but some are, are very similar. Um, you know, I think um, you, you kind of nailed it on the head there with, with the, the term commercializing. And I think that's just what they're doing. You know, you got to conform to, you know, what worked and this worked. So now everything else has to be this way because we know it'll work and we don't want to change that. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's part of the issue. Uh, there's not enough risks. Um, you know, and, and myself as an artist, you know, I'm, I'm all in. So I'm, I'm taking all the risks possible here by, you know, doing something that obviously the fans are loving and, you know, um, you know, just hopefully, like I said, just kind of, uh, make, make that break and, and, and change things a little bit. Well, the thing is history has shown us just from the legacy of artists that have come before you and to come ahead of you, it's music has a continual evolution and, the way society has shifted artists into these commercialized boxes makes me a little concerned for the future. But the thing is there are going to be always artists like yourself and other artists that are willing to take the risk and put yourselves on the line, whether it's a failure or a success because you do it because <clears> you <throat> want to do it and you're not afraid of rolling the dice on that. And I, I just think more artists really need to embrace that bravery because art is such an expressive medium for anything and having to do it within a confines of a box just seems very restricting but also probably more stressful than if you're out of the box yeah and uh absolutely i, I you know I've, I've dealt with that um i'm still still dealing with that like especially at uh, you know canadian country radio i'm a little too rock uh for country or i'm a little too country for country and uh you know that that can get a little confusing especially as an artist uh, so that's been hard, um, you know, especially, uh, especially for, for what we're doing, but, um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the bonus thing about, you know, things like streaming, you know, these streaming platforms give us as artists a whole different, um, 
you know, way of getting our music out there, you know, a whole different audience. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it gives us a whole different platform to, to, to reach out and make fans. I mean, there's guys like, for example, in the country music world, I mean, you know, you look at someone like Sturg Sturgill Simpson, you know, who was busking outside the CMAs, nominated, uh, actually not nominated, won uh, a Grammy for Country Album of the Year, but wasn't in any of the CMA, um, you know, CMA awards whatsoever. So he wouldn't bust outside the Bridgestone Arena. That I thought was pretty cool. <clears throat> and it's unique. Who does that, right? Um, but a guy like that, you know, he's, he's riding a bus, selling on arenas and, uh, making great records and, and making more fans along the way and doing his thing. And, and, you know, um, folks in the industry definitely know his name. And I mean, he plays late night shows like Jimmy Kimmel and, and stuff like that. So it kind of, you know, gives you a feel of, you know, you, you can do this, uh, without your terrestrial radio, but at the same time, you know, of course I'd love, I'd love to have, have, uh, you know, more radio on board and. And I think they'll they'll come along. I think I think they will, and especially with this new album coming along, we've we've adapted a little more, and uh, you know we'll see what happens. Yeah, I want to ask because that was the one thing I did think about when I was listening to the music because I know how finicky, especially country radio and rock radio, can be with assigning genre as well as like deciding what makes the new playlist, and it has to be in that <coughs> line, but also not in that line. Like it makes me laugh when I hear it's a country song that's too country for country radio. Yeah. That, that just, it's <laughs> the biggest oxymoron you can think of, but like it, yeah, with, with this genre, like what's been the biggest challenge for you personally? Um, I think, I think just, just not sounding like anybody else. Um, and, and again, for me, I think that's extremely important uh, to, to do your own thing. And, you know, you want people to, to, you know whether it's on radio or streaming that you know i remember like for example when i when i you know growing up listening to eric church and brad paisley even going further back i hear one note merle haggard merle haggard's voice i hear one note i know it's him guys like vince gill you know it's him and it could just be the guitar playing especially guitar players that you know my guys in the band you know i, I call them you know guitar nerds where they know all their you know tones and all that stuff i was never that guy that's way above uh, my head but you know, they can tell it's Brad Paisley or Vince Gill just by the tone. And that that's that means, you know, in my opinion, you know, there's there's art there. They've created a sound. They've created something where it's very, you know, distinguished. It's 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 who they are. Um, and yeah, that's just something something I, I, you know, I've been trying to do and continue doing. And and slowly, I think uh, radio is coming on board and it's, it's nice to, you know, right out of the gates, rock radio, especially in the U.S. Uh, and other countries like Germany. In Canada, of course, um, you know, gave me a, a, you know, I'm the first Canadian country artist to ever have a top 10 at U.S. rock radio and gave Travis Tritt his first top 10 at rock radio. So, uh, you know, I think those are those are pretty awesome milestones and and uh, something, um, you know, I think as a Canadian country music artist, we can all be really proud of. Well, in terms of just milestones, that's easily one of the most unique and celebrated milestones i can think of for an artist especially a canadian country artist like a top 10 at u.s rock radio as a canadian country artist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's it's, just take a moment and just yeah. absorb that statement because that's that's, yeah. that's monumental in the in the grand scheme of the music industry well, thank you man like it, that that's truly amazing and it's it's amazing that you are Canadian and you're doing this for Canada, and that's that's what I mean. Canada has such a plethora of talent, especially in the Canadian country scene. That's why, that's why I've been doing this whole CCMA feature with a bunch of a bunch of y'all because there's so much talent, especially in that genre pool, that needs to be pushed out there. And it's amazing that guys like you are on that forefront doing it for the fellow Canadians. So so good on you, man. That's really great. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. So, I, I want to ask because um, obviously we just went through a really rough couple of years for the music industry mm -hmm. with the pandemic. How, how did uh, all that affect you and your team with plans that you guys are going on? Well, it, it certainly changed things. Um, you know, I had um, about 40 dates, uh, 40 amphitheater and arena dates booked across the United States with uh, Breaking Benjamin, Alice Cooper. Um, we, were even, we were even talking to Rob Zombie's camp. So I would have been the first country artist to open up for Rob Zombie, which I think would be really cool. Um, a wild show. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be. I've I've been wanting to see that guy for years, and if I would have, if I, I was able to see him for the first time that way, that would have been fantastic. But I'm sure 
Um, <clears throat> there'll be more of those opportunities once this world opens up, you know, between the UK, Australia, and, uh, you know, Germany, we had a dozen dates there. Um, even we're talking to countries like Italy and France, which I thought was really cool. And then of course I had uh, 20 plus dates with my good buddy, Gord Bamford, um, on the hashtag redneck tour. Uh, we got to show tour, uh, show two, and it, it all came to halt with COVID. Um, so I think it's definitely changed. You know, I waited, uh, you know, started and, you know, my first release was 2014, signed this record deal, started writing this record in 2015 with Kevin and Kane, uh, got my first record deal in 2017. Uh, and then two years after, so essentially it was a, a three and a half, almost four year uh, process of finally getting this music outlaws and outsiders was the first song I wrote with Kevin and Kane Churko. And ultimately, uh, it was the first single. And so we waited, you know, again, four years to finally come out. We got the tours. We had everything lined up. A top 10 hit at U.S. Uh, US Rock, uh, number three in Germany. And we peaked at 12 here in Canada. And then it all came to a halt. So I think that definitely changed things for me. Uh, but it changed things for a lot of people, not just myself. It allowed me to uh, give me time. You know, there's personal things that I've done. Uh, like I finished my private pilot license. Um, I was able to, you know, get my own airplane and, and fly that all summer. Um, you know, but I also got to finish album number two. So album number two is in the bag. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with, with friends and family and, you know, you know, little things like that, that are just extremely important. It's easy to lose track, um, <clears throat> track of, I think I, I got to figure myself out a little more too, which I think was important, especially, uh, things just taken off the way that it happened so fast, but at the same time, you know, took so long to get there in a sense. Right. But it's, it's just a crazy roller coaster that um, I think I'm buckled up for now more than ever. It's such, it's such a wild thing when an artist goes from that development stage to all of a sudden being shoved into the spotlight. Cause it, like, like you said, it's such a quick process because the the chance of getting that mass exposure at, in a short amount of time is so uncommon in the industry and it's very rare to have such a focal attention but when mm -hmm. it happens it, it strikes like lightning and it's both exciting and absolutely terrifying uh-huh yeah <laughs> yeah it, it, trust me i've seen it man i've seen it from the inside it's scary especially for the artists because the, the one thing especially with new artists there's a there's a kind of a like, I don't know if it's still a trope, but there's still a trope with a lot of young artists that like think once you get a record deal, you know, everything's peaches and gravy and you're just living your best life and living like a rock star. But no, nah, no, nah, man, that, that, you, that shit gets harder. <laughs> that yeah, it, it, honestly, harder. one thing that I learned is like, and, and I, I had a great conversation with uh, Travis Tritt a few weeks ago and we chatted on the phone for a good two hours. And he was giving me tips and advice and just a great mentor and a great guy to, to learn from. And, um, you know, he's, that was one thing that, that stuck to me that Charlie Daniels told him is that you got to be really good at two things in order to be successful in this business. You got to be able to carry a guitar case in one hand and your briefcase in the other. And uh, it's simple as that. Uh, you know, you're a businessman once, once things get rolling and, you know, like you get a business manager, you have a, you have a manager, you have your day to day, you have a road manager, then you have, you know, uh, either a tour manager and it just keeps pot. And then you have, you know, you have six or seven guys in your band or, you know, anywhere from five to seven guys in your band. Plus, you know, your, your, your merch people, your stage and lighting guys, your front of house, and then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, it turns into a corporation and now you're running, you're literally running an incorporation. You're not just, you know, Corey Marks, the singer anymore. It's like, that is, no, that's the business. And that's, that's the one thing that I definitely learned and learned very fast is, you know, uh, there's a, there's, there's a bit of a difference there. You know, you got to kind of separate yourself from that at, at times. I think it's really important. Yeah. And I think that's also kind of the more positive side of what the pandemic did because the music industry, especially at that point, we were all going just consistently nonstop without mm -hmm. even care about anything else in the world is focusing on what's going on and the music industry as you you also know it has always been very slow to the evolution whether that be through social media through technology whatever it is and having to see the industry 
adjust to no live shows and adjusting to just a straight digital marketplace for two years was just incredible and terrifying to say the least like did, did your camp and and yourself included did you guys adjust anything coming back into post pandemic season in terms of like strategy or anything like that or is it just kind of relatively the same um i think you know it's relatively the same but uh, i mean i i've learned a lot like like these these things uh you know uh not to take this the wrong way but i've, I've talked to complete strangers for the first time like this uh for 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 two years and when outlaws came out you know, we weren't allowed to, to go see radio. So it's like, Hey, you're talking to Sean and then Justin at noon. And then it's like, okay, so you got to go up. I go up in my room and, you know, essentially FaceTime these people. And it's like, Oh, that's what you look like. Cool. Nice to meet you. You know? So that's been a little different, but I think that's helped me grow, um, you know, as an individual uh, when it comes to like socializing. And um, I, I definitely uh, know my phone a lot better um, and, and how to use it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I did, Man, between my Instagram and Facebook and, and other things, you know, I must have done, you know, close to a hundred, if not more, um, you know, live live streams. And I think that was pretty cool because uh, you know, it's it's different. Um people didn't necessarily have to buy tickets, and it was not only a way for fans to connect with the artists, but artists like me to be able to connect with fans. And you know, when I did my Facebook or Instagram live, you know. There was, I remember counting, there was well over, you know, a minimum 20 different countries that were tuning in and never would I have thought that my music would be, you know, when I'm playing to people, there'd be pe people turning, tuning in from Afghanistan, Brazil, and you know, Russia, Germany, there's so Italy, like the list goes on UAE. It's, it's insane. So I think it's helped help me grow that way. And I think we'll probably, you know, adjust to that too, that we know that we can reach out to people this way uh, as well, uh, instead of, you know, just, you know, going out, going out on the road all the time and whatnot. So I think there's, there's probably some different, different planning there and, and some, some different ideas, way to really reach out to fans, of course. Um, but, you know, being out on the road is definitely the best, the best way to do it. Oh, absolutely. Especially in the genre you're in where the live show is so essential to the product of the business and yeah. just seeing how everyone adjusted to the pandemic and having to go from playing live shows to playing in front of your phone for people literally all over the world. And that's, and that's the beautiful side of technology. Like we are all trapped where we were all still very connected in the digital landscape, which I think helped a lot of people get through because we had that con consistent reminder of we're not the only ones going through this because everyone's yeah. going through the same thing. So mm -hmm. if, if I think that kind of com camaraderie and sense of uh, togetherness kind of helped a lot of people through and adjusted their strategies uh, for promotion. But um, yeah. So Corey, what, what are the plans for the rest of the year in 2022 going forward? Cause like we got the CCMAs coming up literally this weekend. Yeah. 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 So I know, are you going to be coming down for that? I, I am going to be coming down. My girlfriend and I are going to make a trip. I have some family down there. Um, and I also uh, saw a plane online that I'm, I'm going to go check out that's uh, in Kitchener. So I got to go check that out. My friends at the Waterloo Warbirds. Um, I've, uh, I, I've been wanting to catch up with them for quite a long time. They've reached out to me on Instagram. So uh, if I can mix, uh, you know, country music, a little bit of whiskey and some aviation all in the one weekend. Why not? And of course, some family. I have my, uh, my Anthony's and my cousins down there. So um, we're going to make the best of it. Head down uh, tomorrow. Um, we've got a nice little Airbnb. And then Saturday, I have the media row from 10 to 1. And then I'm going to go hang out with my, my cousins and my aunt for dinner and all that kind of stuff. Sunday, we have the gala. And, uh, you know, when I, when I head home Monday, I hope uh, I'm bringing North Bay its first uh, CCMA award for Alternative Country Album of the Year that's that's the plan well uh i i'm not attached to ccma so i don't care about my biases being known i hope you win <laughs> I, I <laughs> thank you very much ben. i think you're and not just because you came on the show i think you're just a killer dude with absolutely Thanks, killer dude. tunes and thank and, you and, man. The thing, and the thing is you're genuine and it comes across that way because like i i know i've done podcasts in the past and i've had people dm me like oh that person came across as not a real like they were definitely lying to you i'm like okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't matter to me but it's like yeah it, it's good that like people like you are upholding the genre and and i and i have to say as especially as an old country fan you are 
evolving the genre in such a beautiful and progressive way. I, I'm blown smoke oh, up your ass, you, I know, but like, no, I, dude, I, I appreciate that. that. I, I, dude, I, I, I appreciate that very much, man. Seriously, uh, that's that's you know, that's what I want to do, man. I hope to make those old boys like Merle and Johnny, if they were still around today, they could say, yeah, you know, I like this, you know, that's it's all right, and. Uh, you know, and I always have, have songs like "My Whiskey, uh, My Whiskey or Wine" on the, on the record. That's you know definitely more towards that era of country music. I I, I like to have at least one song on the record uh, dedicated to that. You know, really, you know, my real country roots. But of course, during my live shows, there's always a tribute to Merle Haggard. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I won't let him be forgotten in any way. That's that's for sure. Never to be forgotten, Corey. This has been awesome. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, where can people find you and what you do? Thanks, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Uh, the best way is uh, most likely Instagram, of course. Uh, all the same handles, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook, at Corey Marks Music. And for all news and updates and merch, CoreyMarks.com, and that's where you'll find me. And you're going to find Corey's link in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube or in the description if you're listening to this on any other platform. All right, y'all, this has been the last of the CCMA coverage. Once again, thank you so much to the CCMAs for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, best of luck to all the nominees. Best of luck to Corey and everything thank you. Got going on in the future. I will see you guys on the next one. I have no idea when it's going to be, kind of <laughs> whenever I feel like it. But, uh, yeah, take it easy, y'all. Peace. All right.